The next important type of bonding we have to talk about is pi bonding. So the simplest example we can come up with of pi bonding is between two p orbitals on different atoms. And if they're arranged so that they're simply parallel to each other, they both have the positive phase at the top and the negative phase at the bottom. Now this is a stylized way that we draw it to make it easier on ourselves. But we're supposed to imagine that there's an overlap between the electron density on this atom and the electron density on that atom. And then the region where these overlap, we'll color in blue just to make, make it clear what's going on here. So in both of those regions, we have an increase in electron density. And the reason why it's an increase is at the top, both of these have the same phase. So that's going to give us an increase in electron density there. Along the bottom, they're both negative phase. Since they're both negative phase, when they combine, we'll get an increase in electron density there. Now we notice something is if we draw a, a line between the two nuclei, so let's do that. Nuclei are at the center of the figure eight. We've connected the two centers. It doesn't go through the electron density. So therefore, this is not a sigma bond. It's a new type of bond, which is called a pi bond. So, <clears throat> so long as the tops have the same phase, the bottoms have the same phase as each other, we get a pi bonding interaction. On the other hand, we can have this combination where we have a positive phase at the top, negative phase at the bottom. Over here, we have the negative phase at the top, the positive phase at the bottom. So along the top, they have opposite phase, so we have a decrease in electron density. Along the bottom, we have different phases. So again, we have a decrease in electron density. So this gives us a new type of bond, which is a pi antibody orbital. We can also have pi interactions between d orbitals and p orbitals. In fact, these are going to become very, very important in transition metal complexes. So this d orbital will generally be dxy, dxz, or dyz. And we can have a p orbital on one of the ligands. Now notice the reason we're interested in is where these would interact. So we're looking at the from here to there. Since they have the same phase, that's going to give us a bonding interaction. Since the bottom halves have the same phase, that's also a bonding interaction. Since we have an interaction at the top and the bottom, it makes it a pi bonding interaction. On the other hand, we can also have an interaction the following, where this phase is positive, but that phase is negative. So that gives us an antibonding combination at the top. This phase and that phase are opposite. So that's also going to give an antibonding combination. So we have antibonding at top, antibonding at the bottom, so that gives us overall a pi antibonding interaction. Now here we get to a very interesting situation that comes up quite a bit in transition metal complexes. Notice that we have a d orbital, a p orbital, and a p orbital. So let's interpret these two orbitals, the two p orbitals on the right, as being a molecular orbital on the ligand. So we think of the d orbital as being from the metal, and these two p orbitals as being on the ligands. Now we notice, since these two p orbitals have the same phase as each other, that is a pi bonding interaction. We also see over here that we have positive phase, positive phase, negative phase, negative phase. So this is also a pi bonding interaction. So we have pi bonding between D and P, and then pi bonding between P and P. That's absolutely can have that. On the other hand, a situation which comes up a lot, particularly with the bonding of carbon monoxide, is the following situation. Suppose this is a carbon atom, this is an oxygen atom. We can actually have a pi antibonding orbital on carbon monoxide. And we know for carbon monoxide, this pi antibonding orbital is low-lying and it's unoccupied in the ordinary molecule, but that's an empty orbital that's available. And then we can have a filled d orbital on the metal. And one of the things that the metal can do is it can relieve some of the electron density by back bonding, that back donation. So how that occurs is we have an overlap between a d orbital on the metal. It has a positive phase here, 
same phase there. So it's a pi bonding interaction between the metal and the carbon, but it's a pi antibonding between carbon and oxygen. Just kind of remind us of who's where here. So this is the, that's the metal, that's the carbon, and that's the oxygen. So the electron density goes from the metal into the pi antibonding orbital of carbon monoxide. And since it's an antibonding orbital on the carbon monoxide, this weakens the carbon oxygen bond. Now this interaction here though, that's a pi bonding interaction. So we see that once we start having lots of things going on, we can have a molecular orbital that's both bonding for some of the atoms, whereas it's antibonding for other ones. So we cannot simply define a bond as being bonding or antibonding once we start to have multiple interactions going on. And these types of interactions become incredibly important in transition metal complexes. In an octahedral transition metal complex, we can form two different types of pi bonds with the central metal atom. One has a T1U symmetry, and that's the symmetry of the p orbitals on the central metal atom, which we can see here. So the darker blue, darker red is the two different phases on the Ungarada p orbital on the central metal atom. And then we can see the p orbitals of the proper phases to have a pi bonding interaction on the ligands. So this is the combination that would combine with the px orbital. Then we kind of turn it this way. We would see the interaction with the py orbital because remember we are doing in this direction to the right is the x, to the back is y, and then up is z. So this is the px combination. This is the py combination. And then if we turn it this way, we get the pz combination. Again, in all those cases, we have a mirror, we have mirror symmetry through the center. So we kind of explode our view. Kind of this works pretty well for the PZ combination. We can see where the, for each one of these P orbitals, we have four ligand orbitals that have the proper symmetry to pi interact. Now, in general, this type of interaction will not be important because we're already using the P orbitals for the T1U sigma bonding combinations. And for most complexes, the sigma combination will be a more important interaction than the pi interaction with this T1U orbital. Generally, the more important pi bonding interaction with a transition metal complex will have T2G symmetry. We recall before that there are no uh, ligand orbitals that have T2G symmetry for sigma bonding, so the T2G orbitals of the metal, the DXY, the DXZ, and the DYZ will generally be non-bonding. But once we have pi interactions, these orbitals become available. So we see in the center here, we see something like a DXY orbital. And then we can see the symmetry of the P orbitals on ligands that will have the right symmetry to make a pi bonding interaction. We see that though, for dxy, here's where they'll, they'll go around the edge. That's dxy. If we do it like this, that is the dxz. And then if we turn it this way, that's the dyz combination. So in these cases, we've shown the relevant orbitals on the ligands as being p orbitals. But very often, they're not just p orbitals, they're actually uh, pi interactions themselves. So here, we've drawn them as, so we see the metal d orbital in the center. So that's the dark blue and dark red. And then it's interacting as a pi bonding combination. But here, instead of just being a p orbital, it's two p orbitals right next to each other. And we notice something about the two p orbitals, that they have different phases. So this is the equivalent of a pi antibonding orbital. So this would be the interaction that the D orbital on the metal atom would have with a pi antibonding orbital 
on something like carbon monoxide. So here we see another example of that. So here would be a two p orbitals next to each other in a pi antibonding combination, but they have the right symmetry to make a pi bonding combination with the central atom. For the other combinations, this is just an ordinary p orbital. So we can either have a p orbital on the ligand or a pi bonding combination, but more commonly we have a pi antibonding combination. And it's that pi antibonding orbital that interacts with the metal that's responsible for carbon monoxide and cyanide having such a large splitting in the spectrochemical series.